Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 339. Today we're joined by Frank Van Dunn. We're going to talk about rights and whether they exist and how we can show that they exist and whether we can defend libertarianism without rights. So all kinds of interesting questions to be answered today. Frank Van Dunn is a senior lecturer in philosophy of law at the University of Ghent. He is widely published. We will link to his faculty page over on the show notes page for this episode, which is tomwoods.com slash 339. So let's talk now to Frank Van Dunn. Hope you enjoy it. Frank Van Dunn, welcome to the show. Hello, Tom. Glad to be on your show. You've done very, very important work in uh, the area of natural law, natural rights uh, from a libertarian standpoint. And these are issues that, uh, that you know, create confusion even in the minds of some libertarians. And I thought some clarification of them might be in order. And to do that, I, I'm referring to a couple of your articles. Uh, one of them is an article, uh, I'll link to both of these on the show notes page for this episode, by the way, which will be tomwoods.com slash 339. But the first one, where I guess I'll probably spend most of the time, has to do with contrasting the Universal Declaration on Human Rights with classical natural rights theory. Let's begin, therefore, with what in the idea of natural rights, or explain the idea of natural rights as a libertarian would believe it, so that we can then use that to critique the Universal Declaration. Well, the uh, the, the main difference, of course, is that uh, natural rights, uh, as I understand them, uh, are rooted in the notion of natural law. So uh, you have to start with natural law and then go to natural rights. And then uh, if you want to speak about uh, human rights as they are understood today in the second half, uh, since the second half of the uh, 20th century, uh, you have to move away from natural law because there is really no connection between human rights and natural law. Right, so if I may, I'll start with the natural law concept uh, rather than strictly with natural rights, which comes second, right? Well, certainly. In fact, of course, the very, the very idea, the very words natural law are extremely controversial in our day and age, as you well know. Yes. Yes, uh, of course, the, uh, it's, it's a word with a long history, and uh, history is never very kind to words. <laughs> so when most people uh, hear about natural law, they have in mind uh, who knows what kind of theory of it. But you have to go behind the words to uh, a sustainable concept, so to speak, a concept that makes sense. And uh, it's rather fortunate that in in English uh, we speak of natural law, whereas in uh, Latin, for example, uh, you would speak of the lex naturalis or something like that. Uh, and law and lex uh, are two different concepts. The English word law uh, originally meant order. So the uh, natural law is basically the natural order, not the natural order of nature or the natural order of uh, the universe or something like that, but the natural order of the world. And the world is the human experience, all human affairs, all things that are either human persons or dependent for their existence on uh, the activities on on human persons. So the question uh, for natural law theorists is, what is the natural order of the world? Right? And the uh, first question you ask about an order is, Uh, What kind of distinctions do you have to make in order to uh, get the order? For example, if you are ordering your library, you have uh, a variety of uh, distinctions that you may make. Uh, Books are different because of their authors, their titles, their sizes, their colors, whatever. So you can order according to different distinctions. Now, if you look at the, the world that is the age of man, the the, the human experience, the three most basic uh, distinctions, which you cannot bypass in in any case, are first the distinction between a person and a non-person, an animal or or an object. Uh, Second, 
the distinction between one person and another, and third, the distinction between what belongs or uh, is part of one person's life and part of belongs to another person. Once you respect those distinctions in your actions, your actions are in order with the world. If you start uh, treating people uh, as you would treat an animal or an object, uh, you are no longer acting according to the natural order of the world, the natural law of the world. Similarly, if you mistake one person for another, you are confusing the world of persons, and confusion is the opposite of, of order. And again, when you are uh, taking or uh, being taken by another person, or what belongs to another person, uh, then of course you have all these uh, sources of uh, conflict in the world. Confusion, conflict, all these things undermine the order of the world. So what is the, the basic idea of natural law, and this goes beyond any uh, uh, things that may add to it, but it's the basic conception of natural law that is that these distinctions ought to be respected, and that means ought to be respected by human beings, because as far as we know, uh, here on Earth, these are the only beings or uh, things that are able to respect or disrespect an order, right? So that's the, the, the basic idea. The, the idea of uh, libertarian rights is, of course, derived from that in the sense that uh, persons have rights uh, as against non-persons who have no rights. Uh, every person is who he is and not somebody else. So that these persons, these rights are personal also in that sense, and they extend to what people uh, do and accomplish in the world, what they say, uh, their works, uh, their products, and so on. So that's in, in a very short overview, the, uh, the link between natural law as the natural order of the world and the uh, libertarian conception, or rather concept, of uh, personal rights. Does that make sense? It does, although you can imagine, and I'm sure you've encountered critics who will say that there are as many versions of natural law as there are philosophers, and so really natural law is just uh, it's a way for philosophers to conceal their own already existing ideological prejudices. Now, I don't happen to agree with that, but I know that that's often stated. I'm sure you've responded to that at one time or another. Yes, of course, but if you look at the... Uh the literature on natural law, uh, this is not uh, usually stated in uh, distinctions that, in fact, every uh, person who is not completely insane can make, distinction between persons and non-persons and so on, uh, but it is usually stated as if it was not an order we are talking about, but as a system of uh, rules, right? And then... Uh, if you go back in history, you find that, the, uh, yeah, for example, Thomas Aquinas, when he speaks of uh, natural law, he brings the concept, as it were, logically under the, uh, the concept of rule. Right? It's, a, it's a measure uh, rather than a, a distinction to found an order. And if you look at the uh, further development of theories of natural law, they become ever more uh, normative rather than uh, stating the conditions of uh, order in the world. And you can also say peace in the world, right? The conditions of peace, uh, orderly coexistence, uh, orderly uh, conviviality, the, the way people uh, deal on a friendly basis with each other. So it is quite true that... Uh, people have used the concept of this is natural for their own preferences. But uh, the concept I have uh, uh, outlined at the beginning is not dependent on my preferences, but on the fact, can you or can you not make a distinction between persons and non-persons, between uh, one person and another, and between what one person says and does, does and what another person says or does, right? So this is 
uh, not quite the, the same uh, concept. In fact, it is a very uh, different concept from that which looks at natural law as a system of rules that serves and has been used very often uh, to justify uh, particular policies or regimes or whatever. And that is, of course, an objectionable uh, concept of conception of, na of natural law. Well, now that you've described the natural order of the world, how can we concisely describe what people's individual rights consist of? Well, it is, uh, if, if you use the language of rights, uh, it's of course also a very ambiguous language, as you know. Uh, but in terms of rights to being treated, is first the right to be treated as a person, right? Uh, then the right to be treated as the person you are, and second, the right to be treated uh, as the author of the things you do, right? Uh, being respected as the author of the things you do and say, rather than being uh, treated as uh, some distant cause of what another can appropriate. I wasn't planning to ask this, but how do the so-called rights of animals fit into this? Because some people have argued that they that animals have some kind of rights. I mean, certainly, maybe not what human beings have, but certainly more than a stone might have. How, how does your outlook uh, come down on this and explain this? Well, if you're uh, looking for animal rights, you won't find them. You, you find rights only in, the, uh, in speech, in uh, argumentation, in the, uh, let's say, the intellectual intercourse of people. It's not something that you can, can find. No, we may attribute rights to animals, we human beings eh, can, can do that, we can attribute rights to anything whatsoever, but that does not make having rights or not having rights an, an element in the life of animals or say the life of a, uh, a beautiful building. Right? It's, it's not something that belongs to that thing in itself. We, we, can, we can ascribe rights to anything. So people who say animals have rights, uh, they say that to other people. But it does not uh, make sense if you say, well, what is having a right to an animal? And if, once you, if you start losing that distinction between persons and non-persons, then you get to, into all these uh, weird sorts of arguments which say, well, if animals don't have rights, people don't have rights because they're animals too. Or if people have rights, then animals have rights because they're just as much animals as we are. But then you look, overlook the basic distinction between uh, persons and non-persons, between being able to act as a person, to take responsibility, to be willing to answer for your, uh, to answer questions, to be uh, answerable uh, when, when, you do, when you do something that uh, hurts another or harms another or uh, seems wrong to another. The whole dimension of right in the sense in which it is opposed to wrong uh, is lacking as far as we know uh, in the rest of the universe. It is only in the intercourse of intelligent rational animals, human beings, rational animals, as they were called, that this distinction between right and not right is made. And, uh, of course, if you say the right, uh, people have right, logically speaking, this can be only a right to do right. There can be no right to do wrong, right? And so the, logically, or from a philosophical point of view, it does not make sense to speak of animal rights uh, unless you can say or are prepared to say that animals can do wrong or that buildings can do wrong or that the oceans can do wrong and so on. Yet I wonder if a critic might say that perhaps animals, though being sentient and being able to feel pain, might occupy some kind of middle ground somewhere. And, and we, we can draw that conclusion from the moral intuition we have that while there's no moral problem with mistreating a 
you know, an automobile or a microphone or a, a frisbee, there is a there does seem to be something wrong with being gratuitously cruel to an animal. Where is that moral intuition coming from, if not from some kind of special status that an animal has that other non-human uh, entities do not? Well, I should say that it does not come from a special status of animals, but from the fact that we have certain sympathies uh, and a closeness to certain animals and not to others. Uh, Cruelty to animals uh, is, uh, of course, something most people do not like, but that does not mean that uh, any right of an animal is... uh, harmed or violated or whatever. It is something we do not like. And we can strengthen that claim by saying animals have rights, but that doesn't change anything for the animal itself, right? And when a a lion uh, attacks and eats an antelope, are we going to say that the lion uh, is violating a right of the antelope? So it, it does not really enter into the, uh, the object of animals, apart from human, rational animals, uh, the concept of right. All right, let's shift, shift gears, because I do want to talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. What is this document, and can you list for us some of the rights that you'll find in there that are not compatible with the classical natural rights theory? Well, first of all, it is a uh, historical document that was uh, put together by the uh, the victors of the Second World War, and the uh, these people were not, uh, as it were, acting philosophically. They were trying to uh, promise to the world that their victory would bring uh, well-being and welfare. and and wealth to everybody, uh, and indeed everything that was according to the aspirations of mankind, as they called them. So it was something, uh, it was more a political program than a document about uh, the law of the world, the order of the world. Uh, As far as I uh, remember from my student days, it was not considered very important by lawyers, right? It was a sort of declaration of intention, not a a declaration of rights uh, in the classical sense, where it was said, you have these rights. The declaration, uh, the Universal Declaration of uh, Paris, of uh, human rights, stated that we states commit ourselves to uh, fashion our policies according to the the following propositions. And the language they used was uh, indeed the language in which the word right figured prominently, but uh, only in the context of every man has a right to something, independently of whether that man has done anything to achieve it or uh, even expressed his want uh, is wanting to have it or his willingness to invest to acquire it this was just we assume that everybody aspires to be well educated to re- to be a, a basic income or a secured income to have a decent standard of living to be well treated uh, and so on this was an assumption of what people want, not of the rights people have. But that's the, the basic distinction. So this this uh, idea that your wants determine what you want uh, uh, determines your rights rather than what you are. You have in the article a, a vivid example of how we might think about one of these so-called rights being enforced. You, and I think this is a, a very useful thought experiment that I've used myself, that you imagine two people on a desert island trying to enforce their, I don't know, their right to an education on each other or their right to a paid vacation. What would be the outcome in that case? Well, the outcome would be uh, that the strongest wins, wins right? The, uh, if I want, 
you to provide me with a pension or an education, whatever, and you want me to provide you with it, then uh, either we give up and withdraw each into his own part of the island, or uh, we fight it out. So it's a war of all against all that ultimately decides unless we uh, quit from each other as much as from the, the community uh, on the island. We are no longer part of it, so we, we withdraw. But if we cannot withdraw or will not withdraw, we end up in a war. And then it's the, the victor who uh, sets the rules, right? And he will say, you provide me with what I want. So strictly speaking, when we say that people have a, you know, a right to life, liberty, and property, let's say, we, we talk about a right to life, what we really mean, if we want to be precise about it, is a right not to be killed. It's not a right to life. You don't have a right to a kidney dialysis machine to be kept alive. You have a right not to be killed. You don't have a right to property. You have a right to, have, to enjoy your property unmolested and not have it taken from you. So this is, I think, the, a, a, the proper way to understand the negative rights of, uh, of the classical view. Yes, uh, where the, the right to things and uh, the right to something or to many things is concerned, uh, that's a, exactly uh, correct what you say. Right? These things are scarce. Uh, they have to be produced. They have to be maintained. You cannot simply say, because I want it, somebody else or everybody else should see to it that I have it. Whereas the, the negative rights of which you speak uh, are easily uh, accomplished by saying, okay, uh, you want an education, uh, see that you can get it, and I'm willing to help you, but uh, not by being, say, made into your, your Greek slave to give you a Roman gentleman's education. Right? I'm going to, by the way, link on the show notes page to your website. It's not an easily, it's not a page that's easily given out uh, online, so I'll link people to it at tomwoods.com slash 339 so that people can read more of your work. You have quite a few uh, articles uh, there and a number of other resources. Uh, I appreciate the discussion today. I mean, this is, this is a, a conversation that libertarians love having, talking about rights. But on the other hand, there are libertarians, I might add, who really don't think rights talk is all that important, that, that we can justify the entire libertarian apparatus from a strictly utilitarian standpoint. Do you see any flaw in that? Yes, I do, because the, uh, when you think in terms of uh, utility, utility maximization and so on, uh, you lose, as it were, the right to talk about rights. Uh, when you talk about rights, one question, one question you have to answer is, uh, how do you know it is a right? How do you justify your claim that it is a right? Now, the utilitarian has basically no answer for that question. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, what he says is, uh, we will go about and see what maximizes utility, and since we do not know that beforehand, We'll try it out. And that may lead to a war if one party does not uh, give in, or it may lead to some sort of negotiation, or it may lead to a parting of the ways. Right? But you cannot justify anything outside the context of argumentation. Uh, that's how the, the concept of natural law, natural rights, in my view, links up with the, uh, the ethics of argumentation, which is, uh, of course, also uh, discussed and contested in m some many libertarian circles. But you have to uh, make a distinction that's basic for me, a distinction between questions that can be solved by argumentation and questions that can be solved by a negotiation. And the thing uh, that strikes me as irrefutable when you pose these two questions, uh, what can be solved by argumentation and what can be solved by negotiation, is this. What can be solved by the one and by the other is itself the question that can only be uh, solved by argumentation, not by negotiation. Because negotiation 
can always be the strong against uh, the weak, you can always, always be subjected to exploitation by uh, the one who has the, the momentary advantage. So you have no uh, compelling reason for any rule. Every rule may uh, be renegotiated uh, whenever the circumstances change. And that, of course, gives absolutely no certainty or no basis for making judgments about what is right and what is not right. Every judgment has to be linked to a particular situation of particular uh, individuals at a particular time. And two streets uh, further on, it, a similar situation may be resolved in a completely different way, merely because the parties doing the negotiation uh, are different or have different uh, relations to one another. Well, I think I'm going to leave it there. I'll link also to uh, the, the general subject of argumentation ethics, which could obviously be an entire program in and of itself, and I find it quite interesting, too. And as you say, it has been discussed in libertarian circles and been the source of additional controversy. But we'll uh, we'll leave things off here. I will link people to your site over at tomwoods.com slash 339. And thank you very much for helping to clarify a lot of these ideas for us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right, everybody, one quick little story before I let you go. It turns out, I was just informed yesterday, that Ralph Nader, who's been a guest on this program, as a matter of fact, actually purchased 1,200 copies of the book that I edited with Murray Polner called We Who Dared to Say No to War, American Anti-War Writing from 1812 to Now, so that they could be distributed to students. And that just blows me away. That is absolutely fantastic, wonderful piece of news. I'm reporting on that in my newsletter, by the way, which I send out eh, once a week, but sometimes when I'm a lazy bum, you know me, right? It's about three times a month. But make sure and get that at TomWoods.com, because when you sign up for my newsletter, you also get a free copy of my lengthy, you know, like probably 55,000-word ebook called 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered. Plus, you get a fairly unobtrusive and nice little newsletter from me fairly infrequently. I mean, yeah, three times a month, you know, that's about what you're going to get. But you get that nice ebook. So sign up for that at the top of TomWoods.com. Tomorrow we talk Bitcoin once again. We haven't talked about Bitcoin in quite a while. And, um, well, I'm going to have some critical questions to ask our guest, who will be no doubt uh, equipped to answer them. But there are a lot of lingering questions on this subject, and I'll try and get them on the table. Thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss an episode. We do this Monday through Friday. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.